welcome back. All right, so we're going to talk about regulation momentarily. Um, on my list here, the first one is pilot command. Who is pilot command and what does that entail? Okay, if I have two people, so Levine is a certified pilot, and I'm a certified pilot. I've been doing it a lot longer, got a couple more ratings than she has, but that doesn't automatically make, it, make me PIC. Uh, if I'm flying with a student, I'm sitting in the right seat, they're in the left seat, I'm still pilot in command. So if the seat, I'm, you know, left seat, right seat, not automatic, it's basically, it's a conversation that we have. If, um, and we need to clarify this sometimes, and we kind of almost need to share that. Um, if both of us die in an aircraft accident, then our heirs, okay, mine want to sue her and hers want to sue me, and there's no way to know who is pilot in command. But pilot in command, you're responsible for all of those things that we've talked about. You're responsible for uh, verifying the weather. You're responsible for weight and balance. You're responsible for the performance of the airplane. You're responsible for the pre-flight. Yeah, just keep on going down the list. Uh, you know, make sure you meet the insurance requirements of an airplane before you accept the PIC responsibilities. And if you don't, maybe you want to send a text, hey, you're PIC for this flight because I don't meet that. If you haven't a text now, there's no doubt who is PIC. Um, alcohol? All right, eight hour bottle of throttle. If, uh, assuming my drink here had alcohol in it, and it doesn't, y'all can verify that, but one sip, I don't fly for eight hours. Am I incapacitated? Am I, you know, I mean, you're like, okay, so one sip, I'm done for eight hours. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, eight hours, if I can write that better, eight, uh, eight hours, and it's 0 .004. Okay, so if you tied one on last night and you were really drunk um, and you stopped drinking at midnight, at 8 a.m., theoretically, if you're less than 0 .04, you can go fly. Yeah, I you, thought it was point oh four. You got point oh, oh, oh four. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. Zero point zero four. Yeah. And so it. I mean, all right. You are still impaired. Trust me. You are still impaired. If you're a student pilot struggling with landings or some other uh, area of your flight training and you're struggling, and you typically go home and you drink two beers or have a whatever every night. Um, they've, they've done studies, uh, they did it in a controlled environment with simulators, and they gave people specific amounts of alcohol. Two beers, you will be less than 100% for up to three days. Okay, so something to think about. Uh, yeah. Three days before your check ride, maybe you don't want any alcohol, mm -hmm. period. Not that you're illegal, but we mm -hmm. want to be at 100%. So understanding, wow. Wow. we yeah. want to, you know, uh, like I say, but we've seen it, you know, somebody that drinks regularly in the evenings and then they go to fly the next afternoon, uh, they're, they may, you know, they're well below this, but they're still, they're still affected by that. Uh, Pre-flight requirements, weather, weight and balance performance, runway information, those are all your responsibility. I don't need to know, I don't go into my chart and say, okay, my airplane needs 850 feet of runway under today's conditions. I've got 5,200 feet of runway, it's plenty, I'm good to go. I've done my pre-flight. I'm going over my friend's runway that's 2,100 feet long, and yeah, maybe I need to go do, you know, and again, I know the airplane book says it'll do it, but now I need to know, am I comfortable doing it? And I need to do a little more uh, self-evaluation and airplane evaluation. Uh, minimum safe altitudes. Hmm, okay, what does that mean? <sighs> okay, flying over unpopulated areas, I need to stay, I got a little house out here, right? A house has a 500 foot bubble. I didn't do that very well. But it's kind of like, okay, 500 feet, 500 feet, 500 feet, 500 feet. I just can't get within 500 feet of the house. I can be down here peeking in their windows from 500 feet horizontal, <laughs> but, but they've got a 500 foot window. Okay, then I also have a requirement that I have to be in a position to make a safe landing 
without undue threat or harm to people on the ground. I can kill myself, but I'm not supposed to hurt the people on the ground. So some of this kind of comes into play there. But this 500 foot is over any person or any structure. Okay, is my fence a structure? Yeah, kind of not. My house is. We can, you know, we can argue some of the details. Uh, one little scenario, it's kind of like, okay, uh, your friends, you know they're going to the lake. You think it'd be fun to buzz them on the lake? So you go down really close and then you think it's hysterical because the boat turned over and you can just imagine your friends floundering and then you open up the paper the next day and there was a four-year-old that drowned. And you're like, oh, now I kind of feel bad. <laughs> I mean, we don't do stupid, okay? Because maybe it wasn't your friend, maybe it's somebody else's boat that you buzzed. So you don't be buzzing those. So minimum safe altitude, glide to a safe landing without causing a threat to other people. Doesn't mean you, it means the other people. And not more than, not closer than 500 feet to people or persons or property, or uh, like say their structures. And okay. that's not in a congested area. I was that's, that yeah, 500 is. feet for the non-congested. Over a city, a congested area, it's a thousand feet. Okay, and what constitutes a congested area? Oh, that one's kind of fun. Um, is two houses congested? is six or ten. I don't know. There's not a clear cut. My answer is if they got a school or a church, it's definitely congested. If it's more than about five or six houses, you know what? A thousand feet. It's really, how hard is that? Better to be safe than sorry. Uh, oxygen? What about over, um, I don't remember reading something about wildlife. A wildlife refuge now. Uh, and those are depicted by the lines with the dots like this. And so they're on the map. Not more, you got to be more than 2,000 feet above a wildlife refuge. Don't stampede the buffalo. Okay. <laughs> and so understanding how that works. Oxygen requirements. Um, above 12,500, the pilot or required crew on oxygen uh, anytime you're there for more than 30 minutes. Okay, so, okay, if I'm flying and Lavina's flying with me, we're both pilots. Sorry, I get the oxygen and you don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it really yeah, only requires yeah. one of us to be on oxygen. That's it. Okay, at 14,000 feet, required crew has to be on it 100% of the time. What this is, is it's giving me a chance to go over the mountains, come down the other side, go over that ridge without having to have oxygen. Is it safe? Is it smart? That depends on you, okay, and how your body tolerates hypoxia. Okay, uh, at 15,000 feet, you got to make it available to everyone in the airplane. So if there's four of us in this room and I've got an oxygen tank that will give four hours of oxygen, okay, and I'm like, well, all right, I have to make it available to you guys, but we're gonna be up here for a couple hours, so I need y'all to say no when I offer it. Yeah, that's not the intent, that's not the way it works. I need to be able to let all everyone in the airplane have oxygen, I've gotta have the capacity so everybody gets oxygen for the full time, okay? Uh, and if we wanna be even smarter, better, go down to your local drugstore and get an oxymeter and put it on your fingertip. Okay, if you can afford an airplane, you can, they're less than $50, typically $30 to $50 is what they cost. Buy one, you put that on your fingertip. Especially Doctor at that 12.5 altitude. When I'm sorry? You, especially at that 12.5 when you, it says right. 30 minutes yeah. or okay, more. Okay, that, that little oxymeter does not give you permission to, to violate these numbers, huh. but it's gonna tell you that I may need it lower than that. Yeah. Okay, so the doctor told me at 88%, you're losing cognitive function. Okay, at 91, 92%, I get a headache mm -hmm. and I start to feel bad. That's my reaction. Okay, so if I put that on my finger and I'm flying an airplane, I'm down to 91 or 92%, I need to start doing something before I lose cognitive function. Right. And then he said at 65%, you're unconscious. Yeah. Okay. 
Ah, oh, good to know. <laughs> okay, so I, I, you know, while I still have a little cognitive function, let me get down here to a safer altitude. Okay, then we can start talking about the eyes. We've got those rods and cones, and I don't care which ones are which. Just know that the ones that we use in the night uh, are different than the ones we use in the day. And the ones we use at night are generally more susceptible to oxygen deprivation than the ones we use in the daytime. So that's why they tell us we need, you know, I had somebody's like, well, there's less oxygen in the air at night. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, people will tell you anything. Okay, but they were like, well, why do we have to have oxygen at a lower altitude at night? Because our vision is more susceptible to that oxygen deprivation at night. So my vision might start to go, I don't know, whatever that number is. But, and then if I have somebody who's compromised, uh, um, you know, uh, your aunt's a heavy smoker. Okay, you got com compromised lung capacity, so they're, they're gonna start feeling this much lower than 15,000 feet. So I think you touched quickly on the 15,000 feet. We've got four hours of oxygen in the airplane. We've got four people. So we can only be up there for one hour. Correct. Even one though, even even though, though mother-in-law in the back doesn't. Even though she says, no, I can't uh -huh. stay there beyond that one hour. Okay. Or, you know, you get caught and you got some explaining to do. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, we make safe, smart decisions. We don't try to work our way around these rules. Mm -hmm. You know, now you can go to the store and buy those little oxygen, little, you know, get them in Colorado. Uh, are those legal in the airplane? Well, they're not illegal necessarily, right. but it doesn't meet doesn't meet these oxygen requirements. That being said, if I'm at 8,000 feet and my aunt over there with the compromised lung, you know, if I've got one of those little bottles for her, fine. Who cares? Okay, but um, but if we're trying to meet these, it has to be an FAA-approved, certified oxygen system. Okay. And so, where am I? Uh, uh, speed limits. Below 10,000 feet, thou shalt not go over 250 knots. Okay, my 172, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but understanding, above 10,000 feet, the speed limits go away. That's why the cloud clearances change when we get above 10,000 feet, because the closure rate between two airplanes, okay, if he's doing 400 and I'm doing 120, it's a little bit more intense than we're down here, both of us uh, doing whatever. Okay, so my timer says it's time to take a quick break. Okay.